And good afternoon, and thank you very much for your patience. I'm uh, just going to stop the lovely music, um, and I'm going to uh, go live with my camera. Greg, hopefully you're also there, um, hiding away yeah. in, the background. <laughs> in the background. Are you well? I'm good, thank you. Yourself? Uh, yeah, not too bad. Um, I apologise immediately. It's actually 2 o'clock, not 4 o'clock. So um, my bad, it's that time of day already. So um, Greg, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, and I know that we've my got pleasure. people um, still joining us. Um, but um, first of all, um, it's, it's an absolute honor and delight to, to have uh, the Yoda master of iPad, as we <laughs> like to call you. Um, I know you've been doing this a long time. And I think one of the great things that we've seen um, over the last sort of three or four months is being able to share our customer journeys. And, and this is absolutely long awaited. Um, so, Greg, I guess um, a brief introduction of uh, Greg Hughes, Vice Principal. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, so, yeah, if, if I don't know any of you, my name is Greg Hughes. I'm Vice Principal at the DeFerris Academy in Burton on Trent. Um, I'm also by trade physics teacher, um, and I'm an Apple Distinguished Educator Professional Developer, and we run an Apple Regional Training Centre as well. So, pretty much all badged up. Um, and, yeah, we've been doing this a, a long time. Um, and before that, you know, we, we had quite a lot of involvement with other other things. So I've got quite a lot of experience, about 30 years teaching. Yeah. Um, about 20 doing the IT part. We shall bow down. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, absolutely. Uh, been there and doing it a long time. Um, I think from from uh, from our perspective, it's, it's a great honor for academia to be um, a partner to, to, to the Ferris. And obviously, we, we work very closely. I think the other thing um, that we should just want to announce also is just welcome to any customers from the bigger academia family. So those that, that um, work very closely with our partners, Tukan and Vital. Um, and so um, thank you for joining us today. Also, um, Greg, I know that we're gonna be kind of touching on um, some, some timeline stuff um, a, bit, a bit later on, um, but can you just give us a real overview glimpse of, of where DeFerris is in, in this part of the world and, um, and kind of the size of the, of the, the Academy and Trust? Yeah, so uh, if you don't know the middle part of England very well, um, if you've heard of Birmingham, which most people have, you've heard of Nottingham, um, put a pin in the map in between them and that's pretty much near, near Burton-on-Trent. We're close to Derby, um, so we're a, a you know, reasonable sized town, um, but De Ferris is, is big. So we are now a three campus school. We have um, a year seven and eight campus called Dove. We have a year nine to 11 campus, Trent, and we have a new sixth form campus. It's been open just, just two years now. Um, and we are something like 2,200 students and about 230 staff. So, you know, a very large institution for a school, um, which, is, you know, it's a bit like the Titanic with DeFerro's. You, it's, it's so big, um, you have to plan things properly at the start or it's, you know, it's big schools are hard to turn around. Yeah. Um, I think we've been quite agile and nimble for school. You know, we've, we've done well, um, but a lot of that is, is good strategic planning. Um, yeah. So other than that, we're a fairly, you know, typical comprehensive school. We have the, the full range of abilities and intakes from inner city to, to leafy outer suburbs. Yeah, great. And then a lovely part of the world, I think also quite near to you is not not far from the FA headquarters, right? So that's that's the other. It is. Yep. Right known on entity. Yep. <laughs> so I don't know which is more important, but, you know, um, we, we, it's, it's good. It's good to get an idea of where you are. Um, so in terms of the agenda today, Greg, I think obviously we've discussed it because that's why we're here. But just for those who uh, are on the webinar, um, really, it's really talking about, I guess, um, that journey, you know, why iPad? I think it's, it's a big question that often comes up. Um, and um, the other thing that's also a very hot topic, or, or many of these are hot topics actually, is funding is 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 key. We know that um, the funding mechanism in education is is always a tough um, kind of hurdle to to, to kind of steer. Um, staff training absolutely key. I think it's one of the things that I'm certainly massively passionate about is is that that capacity for for the use of the technology. And then kind of some of the outcomes that you've had um, from your perspective, and I think you, obviously you've been there a long time, so you've seen that massive change. But I think what we're always looking for is, is a measurement of success and being able to discuss that with you is key. Um, and then I guess a lot of decisions that we're seeing around one-to-one -one moves um, probably over the last three to four months has absolutely been um, COVID, right? An absolutely horrendous time for, for many, 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 many people. Um, one of the positives that it has drawn out actually is the ability for people to bring some of their ideas forward. So it'd be good to get your insight on that. Mm -hmm. um, what the future of learning looks like, not just learning actually, but lessons. We know that there's lots of conversations around what it might look like in September and even um, later on in the year. 
Um, and I guess the last kind of bit will be really talking around um, what your future steps might be, because I think there's lots of um, lots of great changes um, with the devices, but also the way that you can use them. So we'll, we'll touch touch on that. So I guess the the first part in your journey really is um, what would you describe your old DeFerro's way as being pre pre iPad? Okay, um, so I've been at the school now 12 years, um, and certainly when I came, we were already trying to lead on what we call new technologies, uh, never a good term. Um, but yeah, a lot of it was based around bringing in laptops. So I think at one point we had about 15 sets of shared laptops. We had probably about 13 IT suites, um, and it was very cost, you know, costly in terms of time and money. And we just, I think like a lot of schools, found laptops not, terribly helpful you got them out half an hour into your lesson they were probably turning on um you know it was difficult to save big files um they just weren't effective we had to dabble with netbooks for a while uh, when they first came out that wasn't a lot better um and i think we were always conscious we wanted to do an awful lot with assessment for learning and you know rapid feedback the ability to diagnostically assess kids in lessons and the technology just wasn't working um and we had a change of principle. He really wanted to look at mobile technology, not just the, you know, the other stuff that we'd been doing. Um, and I think maybe that that was the start of it for us. Um, so we'd had some really good things happening in classrooms on a, you know, maybe a smaller scale. Um, we've done quite a lot as a, a big scale with learning platforms. Um, but the idea was to try and get a bit more consistency and, you know, really look at all the advantages you get from mobile technology, particularly things like tablets. Yeah. And I guess that's that's where the iPad bit came in, right? That's I mean, looking to that kind of mobile device. Um, and at the time, I know that you did a lot of due diligence, and and obviously the, the iPad was the route that you decided to take. Um, in terms of um, the move from from those traditional, I guess, computer suites that you have, uh, or that you had, I should say. Mm financing going from from that kind of format to a new kind of one-to-one -one format is is a pretty big move and and in terms of financing those are tough conversations to be having but how did you how did you find that that transition to looking to that budget to, to kind of fund this bigger project yeah so we um i think about eight and a half years ago 90 years ago we talked to to, to people like yourselves and that's what yeah. gave us a lot of confidence it would work um looking at you know what what tablets could do um, we, we tried a few, but we always liked the iPad because of the versatility of it, um, the flexibility, but also the simplicity of it. You know, it's it's actually a very easy user device, but very powerful. And that, that was appealing to us. Um, and we looked at where we could go with it. And, you know, we realized that if all the students had them, um, you know, you've still got this thing in a lot of schools where you have an IT suite. It's used at most five lessons a day, maybe five one hour lessons. And that's it. You're tying up a lot of money in a, you know, a, a fixed environment, a, a fixed amount of time. Um, and if you could get rid of them and give the device to students, then obviously, you know, that's a better use of money. They can use it in school, out of school, 24 hours a day, every day of the week. Um, you know, IT suites sit empty for probably 30, 40 percent of the year because we're on holiday. So yeah. I think that discussion was really useful. Um, we started looking at financing options for it, where we could save money, how you know, students could contribute a bit, we could fund a bit. Um, and we started with the sick form, really on the assumption that if you couldn't get it right with, you know, 16, 17, 18 year olds, then it wasn't going to work elsewhere. Mm. So that's quite unusual to, to start from the top and come down. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's not that it's not always the norm. But I think I think that goes back to your point you mentioned earlier on about that, the, the key to planning, and having that strategic plan in place is really important. Um, and you mentioned about the the move away from the, the you know those 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 rooms that aren't used for for thirty forty percent of the year. One one of the interesting um, stats that I often get blown away by is that there I think they say that a third of computers in in schools in the UK, primary and secondary, are classed as ineffective. And actually, we talk yeah. about software not being right or um, the powering up; it takes a long time or anything else. But actually, you forget that they're not always they're not used fifty two weeks of the year and. And mm -hmm. actually, by having a one-to-one -one device means that that students can can absolutely do that anywhere, anytime, learn it. Just, um, I think I think one of the things that we often talk about with leadership as well is is that biggest that engagement and that fear of change. But but mm -hmm. the engagement of stakeholders is is really important, isn't it? Because you've had to involve literally from top to bottom. Yeah, it is. I think we were lucky, so we we'd be 
been um, part of the IT register, um, yeah. SSAT, back in you know 12, 15 years ago, when it was Vector was a thing, yeah. um, and there was a big push for, for IT. So we were quite innovative anyway, and I think a lot of staff had got used to having laptops early on, um, and and you know embracing things like learning platforms. So in a way, we already had quite a good level of technical confidence in staff. Um, not always consistent, but you know it was it was better than average, and that helped. Um, and I, I think, you know, I certainly went into the role initially managing the learning platform and then other aspects of technology. And again, I think having a single person as a driver uh, who could look at, you know, holistically all these different elements and piece them together, that was really important, um, particularly from a teaching and learning point of view. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that helped get them on board. We did a really good launch event with the governors. Um, you know, we quite bravely went gung-ho and tried lots of live uh, airplay, doing quizzes with the governors, what do you know about Bert on Trent, which not a lot, it turned out. Um, but again, that convinced them that, you know, this is great. I know nothing about these people, and already I'm sharing their work on the screen. I'm, you know, mm. quizzing them and finding out what they think, how their brain works. Um, yeah, it's really powerful, and I think that really swung it. So we went from a trial that we were going to do with some of the sixth form to rolling out you know 300 to the whole yeah. form at the time just in in a couple of weeks it changed um and that went really well and then obviously that led on to doing you know key stage four and, and so on mm. um but yeah i think you know for me um i still teach eight hours a week um so i was always very conscious that you know hand on heart i can't stand up and say let's do it if it's not going to work properly you know i always had a vision of what i wanted it to do for me as a teacher and if it wasn't going to do that I, you know i can't tell other staff to, to do it and yeah. I think we always felt with things like learning platforms, there was an element of, you know, put any old rubbish on there just to tick the box and say you've done it. Yeah. So it, it had to be technology that was going to improve teaching and learning, really be a catalyst for change, like you say, um, but still simple enough for staff to access. And that, that was part of our real drivers at the mm -hmm. start. And I think I think the other thing is also you know not just engagement with stakeholders but also looking at a, a, a kind of the behind the scenes stuff which is the infrastructure and I think that kind of falls under two things right is the, the capacity of the infrastructure to to deal with suddenly an influx of devices but also the management of those devices is important and and I know you obviously we use an MDM with you and um, that's how you manage mm -hmm. your your devices but I think again that's part of um, when you're talking to stakeholders is you know not just talking about the teaching and learning but also the bits that that support that which is the infrastructure piece and workflow yeah yeah and in terms of the infrastructure i mean we we looked at where it would lead after several years um and we you know we had a sort of four or five year plan so it was always part of our intention to get rid of some it suites as we didn't need them um to get rid of most of the sets of laptops which you know we did um get rid of things like learning platform because a it saves money um but then also because you're not providing um more technician time to those resources you can use them to manage you know the the, the um the, the management system that the mdm and also the ipads themselves yeah so it was migrating from one infrastructure to another in a way we did um again we, we planned before we even started the rollout for improving the wi-fi so you know we improved it a bit we figured out how big it would get after a few years and when we'd have to you know build on it again um, and I think, you know, we're just about to revamp the Wi-Fi again this summer. Um, but, you know, we put one in for about eight years and it, it worked tremendously well. We really yeah. planned for having about 1,200 devices on one site. We have. And it held up. So I think, you know, we, we, we have a few scary moments. Um, but I think like, you know, a lot of good schools, it's all down to that planning. You know, what are, I had a big chart on the wall of 70 or 80 things to do with iPads that I had to do. Most of them actually never happened. Most most of them were, were easy. Um, you know, it's, it's some of the others, how people feel about it, that are harder to address that we'll pick up in a bit. Absolutely. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about workflow as well, because I know that obviously working in the cloud adds a huge amount of value to, to any mobile device. And obviously, mm. one of the great things about iPad is that you can you can use G Suite and you can use Office 365 on there. And you, you guys are a G Suite and you use Google Classroom, as well as all the great stuff that comes from Apple. Um, and I'll come yeah, back. I mean, we, we still... Oh, sorry, Tom. No, 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 carry on. Yeah, carry on, Greg. Actually, you might as well, yeah, that, touch it. That touch was, it, um, again, moving to, 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 to Google Tools allowed us to get rid of some of our, you know, existing um, outlay on things like learning platforms and, yeah. and separate mail systems. And it, you know, again, that was seamless. It was quick to do, integrates well with iPad. Yeah. Um, you know, it's no grief at all, really. So yeah. it's very easy for us to do that. 
Absolutely, and and I think you know, you, it, 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 as you said, it works. It works well, and and I think actually on on talking around some of those barriers that that you kind of face, that you know, there's always a solution. I, what I always say is that sometimes that solution you don't like, but but it's it's about making that informed decision. Um, and I think that you know, this is just an overview. We're not going to touch on all of these, but I'll quickly run through these in terms of these are quite obvious. You know, when you've got a huge amount uh, numbers of students, you've got to leverage that trust support, as you've rightly said. Um, you know, there's the word sustainable there, which actually um, I know has been highlighted before, but it's really about making this having a longevity plan behind it and planning that that five year strategy is really key. But looking at the the prioritization of the infrastructure uh, that that needs to be in place, and what 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 we know is that if things don't work, unfortunately, the first thing that gets blamed is technology, and so I know you try to avoid that. Um, but also looking at the lifespan of the device and you know, what happens at the end of that and if we're going to lease and, and outright purchase and so on. So I think this was just a kind of overview, really come some of those barriers that you face. Is there anything there on there that I've, I've kind of missed that absolutely needs touching on or is it is that kind of good as it is? No, I mean, it, the other barrier obviously is, is you know, falling school budgets and <laughs> rising costs. Yep. And again, it, you know, I think we, we timed it well because we were able to pull back from some of the big spends historically we did on IT. And obviously as this, this came in, you know, that, that just fitted so nicely. Yeah. Um, so it allowed us to work within those tight budgets still and, and still deliver quality. Um, and as I say, you know, I think we ended up doing more with almost with, with less in a way. Yeah. Um, by making that that change of, of approach. Um, yeah. And I, and I think, you know, we for me, I've always said that the key thing is is getting staff at all levels, leadership, you know, teaching staff, support staff to get their head around the switch from a, you know, a fix traditional IT architecture to a, you know, a mobile infrastructure, because then you start to realize the possibilities. And, yeah. and I think that they're off, you know, they're, they're running with it. And absolutely. And, and you say about running off with it. I mean, we talk about barriers that come from the infrastructure and stuff, but also there are some concerns that are raised also by teaching staff or leadership staff, but, but students as well. And again, these are some of the things that we see all the time. Um, you know, why should I bother? And, um, you know, I don't teach ICT. And I think it's a way moving or get away from iPad is an ICT lesson or, or a, a device is an ICT lesson. It forms part of that. Your digital pencil case, yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think also the support, and I've worked with, you know, institutions or trusts even, and not yours, um, but where where teachers even can take devices out of a box for six to eight months because there was a real fear behind it. And I think giving them the support there is is absolutely something that um, that is important. And, and as you rightly said, you're badged as an Apple professional learning specialist. Um, you obviously do a lot of work with Apple as well. Um, and the capacity of staff is key um, because there is a difference from being a, a, a consumer user to a, a user for teaching and learning, right? Yeah, definitely. And I think that, that's why if you look at some of those solutions there, we saying to staff, it's, it's not really negotiable. You know, we've invested in this approach it's not really right to just say, well, you know, thanks, Greg, but I don't do it. You know, it's part of what we do. And I think we found as more people in faculties get involved in it, then it, you know, absolutely does, does improve stuff. Um, so yeah, I think definitely, you know, giving people reasons to do it and the more it's focused on teaching and learning, the more people will get involved from that, um, you know, that aspect, which is, is for me the, the key thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and rightly so. And I think when you look at your timeline that, that is on the screen now, um, you know, it does, you know, it goes back 2012, seems like a, an age away. But, you know, this is this is a really powerful to see actually how your journey kind of developed itself and, and what was going to be a very small pilot became actually quite a big pilot with 300 devices to a point now where we're, we're talking around, you know, the, the, the whole estate having um, having iPad one to one. Um, and you're talking about 3000 iPads across the seven trust schools at the moment. Um, but that's that's a huge step. Yeah, and it, it's taking those early lessons and then scaling it up, you know, to initially to us, to, to more year groups and then to other schools as well. Um, and I think you can see as well, you know, we've reached out and tried to look at the expertise we've got, where can we use it better? So we became an Apple Regional Training Centre. And one of the benefits for us was working with universities, particularly teacher training, uh, because, it you know, it helps with recruitment. It helps skill up our staff. So that, that paid dividends really Again, the Apple Distinguished Program has allowed us to connect with other, you know, top schools worldwide. It's, it's invaluable, really, to keep yourselves. I think schools naturally plateau and you want to keep, you know, improving it and building momentum. 
Um, and, and the same with the Erasmus Plus project. You know, we've, we've done some brilliant work around uh, in Germany, the Netherlands, um, you know, Cyprus, places like that, Poland, Sweden, uh, with schools. And that's allowed us to enrich what we do, to increase the skill of the team, to bring in new ideas from them. Mm. Um, and also money, you know, it's, it's brought in. So it's all helped. Um, and I think those lessons then allowed us to, you know, to continue to develop it. Um, it, it does get harder in some ways as you take more schools on board. It's, um, you know, you can't always replicate everything you did exactly and expect yeah. us to, you know, jump dunk it work. Because it's, you know, like all things, it's not a science. But you can take a lot of those lessons and what definitely worked, what didn't, and try and, you know, continue to build on them while you're still developing that granular flexibility at other schools. Because it's not everything's going to work the same. The, the context is different. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, you know, that's that's our main journey so far. And it's it's been a good one. We've, we've I think we, we've, you know, been pretty pleased with where we started and where it led us to. And there's not a lot of changes I probably would have made in hindsight, which I think is always a good thing to be able to say. Yeah, and I think you're right. You know, hindsight is a wonderful thing. Um, and I think it's also that not it's not a one size fits all, as you rightly said. There's not an exact science to this. And, you know, I've, like you, have been around a long time, but I don't think there's ever one project that's always the same. There's always something that, that changes or isn't quite right, but it's about using that experience that you have had. Um, just highlighting that that point you made about the Erasmus Plus, um, the Apple Distinguished Schools program. Mm. So, so for those who don't know, um, there is a program called Apple Distinguished School. Um, this is an invitation kind of uh, by the only program. And this is um, something that Apple are really passionate about from an education perspective. And it's about showcasing those uh, schools that are doing great things with Apple technology specifically. And it is a worldwide thing. Um, and I think what's been really interesting is also where you've talked about the Erasmus Plus piece and making best use of of, of the experience from schools all across the world is, is hugely powerful. Um, but also you mentioned earlier on about the students that you work with at university. And I think one of the things that we're seeing, and I think um, obviously, um, you know, Matt Pullen well, but one of the things that Matt does as a senior lecturer is support you know future generations of teachers and i think what we're seeing now is there is a big shift to supporting the skill sets of future staff um, that are going to work in the industry to use technology more appropriately and more freely um, would you agree that you get that benefit from the students from from where you work at universities yeah i mean absolutely so we you know we have quite a few pgc students school direct students every year we've always given them a device and training, same as yeah, we would with yeah. any member staff. And I know they really appreciate that. Uh, we've had students come to us, we've run things like our digital book projects. So if you go to deferrers.com slash ebooks, you'll see there's about 50 odd digital textbooks. You know, a lot of those have been built in partnership with the University of Nottingham and their students. And again, we, we skilled them up in things like instructional design, yeah. use of audio and video. Um, and then we go and do hands-on, um, you know, afternoon workshops. We, we we might gear them towards science teachers or maths teachers or English teachers, but a lot of what we do is it's you know led by things like assessment for learning yeah. and engagement, trying to look at um, you know how to model with video and things like that. And I think yeah, again, like Matt says, you know I'm really passionate about that. I think one of the big problems we have is the lack of expertise many teachers get early on. Um, you know, for me, if it was compulsory and everyone did it, I, I think we'd we'd have a much um, stronger level of consistency in the country because it is like that in some countries. Um, yeah, certainly, you know, it's a key role for me. So we, we do a lot of induction with all of our staff when they start. Um, we've already given them some videos, you know, resources to look at. Um, and we'll be doing some, hopefully, um, hands-on training when they start with us in September. And, and then throughout the year, there's a steady program of CPD um, for those new staff as well. As, exactly. As the yeah. stuff we do. And I think that's going back to that longevity piece and, you know, making the program uh, in inverted commas sustainable. It's about... Um, not having to necessarily buy um, traditional books like you have done previously, because you're you're actually kind of fulfilling much more by having that capacity of digital uh, content. Also, the stuff that you use internally, you share absolutely. You know, you go, you can see them in the app store as well. Um, so I think it, that's what adds value to to everything that you do there. Yeah, definitely. And uh, we talked about earlier as a trust. So one of the things we're looking at now we've aligned the the curricula across the trust. Um, and we have trust leaders of, say, science and DT and things like that, um, is looking at how they can work better together. So they did a lot of work um, back in November, well before any of this started, um, on designing, you know, common learning experiences, resources that they could share in, in Quizlet and Neopod and Socrative. 
Uh, and again, that's been a, a godsend with, um, you know, with, with lockdown and, and the remote learning because we were already doing a lot of that anyway. So those yeah. resources that, you know, you can share the, the effort, the manpower. If you've got 30 odd science teachers across the trust, you know, it's great. It's a big forum. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and I think that also feeds into the RTC piece that you know that we've we've talked about um, previously as well. And I'm I'm just conscious that we've got this um, next slide, um, and we're we're kind of um, <laughs> hiding some of the title. But I'm going to um, I'm just going to move us down to to somewhere else. So I'm going to cover us down the bottom, Greg. But cool. um, leadership um, obviously uh, uh, have have been inundated with lots of decision making uh, across lots of uh, all of our schools in the UK at the moment. Um, and I know that you were, you know, very well prepared. But, but in terms mm. of the COVID situation, never, never easy transition. But maybe you found it easier than maybe others would have done. Yeah. So years nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, all had iPads. Um, same in the other trust schools where they got sick forms, or in nine to eleven where they don't. Um, so that was easy. It was. It literally was business as normal. You're used to, you know, loading work to show the old Google Classroom carry on um you know we were doing lots of in-class quizzes and retrieval practice activities with things like quizlet live and neopod and Socrative. um you know kahoot you can run them all remotely sometimes it's challenges not live paced uh, but they still give you valuable diagnostic information on how well students have understood ideas or learned key ideas or remembered them um so for those years it, it was already done the only thing we really had to do was get year seven and eight to make um classes so teachers of you know, year seven, and eight don't have iPads. We have shared sets there at the moment uh, and some iPads for special needs students and some with English as a second language. Um, but because teachers were already using these tools, we just got them to create them for year seven and eight, did the same stuff. And that worked really well with, you know, good response from parents. Mm. Um, you know, we did all that in like a, a day, uh, got the codes out and, and that was really it. Um, so actually it was quite straightforward. Yeah. Um, we did do, and I'll, I'll share the link again in a bit. We put a remote learning guide out for staff. So it was, um, you know, it was about 20 pages, I think, of, of tips, advice, key tools to use, how to embed them into typical, you know, lesson structures and adapt them for um, offline use. Um, I think, you know, with some staff, we had to look a bit more at what we meant by like asynchronous versus synchronous. Yeah. So synchronous learning, you're in the classroom, everyone's doing the same thing at the same time, you know, start this work, 10 minutes, stop it. Um, asynchronous you know, allows them to do it at their own pace, which works a lot better for remote learning, particularly because not all students can be present at the same time. Some of them are, you know, sharing equipment or, or broadband bandwidth at home. Um, so we tried as much as possible to do things asynchronously. And I think that that really helped, um, you know, and, but equally we got pastoral teams to monitor the quality of the work, who was doing it and remind yeah. parents where they weren't. Um, but most of it just using the existing tools are, but you know, we didn't really have to do a great deal with, with technology, which is, you know, it's great because it was embedded, it was working anyway. So it's just really expanding what we did a little bit more to the areas where we, we weren't doing it as much. And I think we, 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 we met up at the early part of COVID, didn't we? Well, I say met up, that we virtually met up and we did a, a <laughs> webinar around um, remote yeah. learning and, and you were involved um, in those discussions. You were absolutely that synchronous, asynchronous piece was which is usually important um, as a conversation piece and actually the, the mindset behind how um, we might be able to continue teaching students. And actually as a parent of an 11 year old an 18 year old, my, my 11 year old, um, you know, his mentality changed over the last four months was at the very beginning, I need to work in the morning and the afternoon to now I know I have a piece of work I need to do during the day and I'm going to choose yeah. to do it at a time that suits. And I think that's really powerful. You talk about um, Kahoot. Um, we use this, Every week we have a, a family Kahoot night where we just do random things around general knowledge questions and everything. And it's fantastic. And I think that's really powerful. Um, mm. and, and actually we can see, you know, lots of people yeah. asking how that is really good from a, a teaching and learning perspective. Um, I think, I think the other thing um, to, to kind, of, kind of look at is the changes that we are having to make now um, as a sector is that um, I think the only positive that's come out of COVID is really having the ability to reshape the way that the education system is and how do we do that teaching and learning in our mm. schools but actually what does that new abnormal really look like because if we're able to have a bit more insight into that shaping 
and looking at the future. I mean, you and I obviously can't go into too much detail, but we're also already talking about plans for your next couple of years and what that might look like and how, the, how does that work and how do you support it and everything else. But that also involves lessons and how that might look, right? Um, but in your mind, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I mean, in, in my mind, we, we've been looking at how you can still plan an online lesson with, um, you know, almost entrance and exit tickets, with, with modeling, you know, videos, with students then demonstrating if they understand that stuff. So, again, because we were doing that quite effectively before COVID, um, you know, we can take the same things and really just move a few items around and do the same offline uh, or sorry, you know, uh, online, um, yeah. but out of normal lesson time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that, that worked really well. So I think, yeah, we, we see a lot of the interaction continuing. Um, to be honest, we, we haven't done an enormous amount of live video lessons. We've tended to pre-record um, and we've used a lot of those quiz tools, not just to, you know, to give them a quiz, but to actually collect the data to see how well they've done. What, what are the issues? Can we use that for whole class feedback? Which to me is is you know more powerful. It's nice to do a live video with thirty five you know little little waving kids. Um, it, it you know it's nice, but it's not always terribly effective. And some of the research coming out is, is saying that uh, um, you know it's it's still hard to to ask them questions and to you know check everyone is doing it. Whereas with tools like Nearpod, you can absolutely check you know what everyone is doing, how good their mm. diagrams are, how they've understood it. Um, so I, I think it's trying to find the most effective and valuable tools to use and then to you know to, to have the confidence to go with them not to be perhaps peer pushed down one or two routes that are popular but but maybe not the best and i think i've seen you know my my, my son uh, as i said he's 11 but I th you know when we said to him he might not go back to school um at the time when we weren't sure what was happening there was very much oh, i'm not that bothered really i've kind of got, mm. got kind of best of both worlds i've got to do a bit of schooling um, I can do a bit of other stuff, um, Fortnite and stuff like that. Um, but he also learned some other skills. But what what was interesting is when they started talking about going back to school, and this go back to your point around having 30 little kids waving at you, sometimes that interaction in class is still hugely valuable. And he missed that interaction and that friendship yeah. um, mm. skill, if you like, that he wasn't getting... Um, from not seeing his friends um, and I think that's that's also what we've seen is that it's, it's where it's solved lots of issues it's also highlighted that we need to make sure that we, we look and supporting around mental health and all those other things and you talked about um, special educational needs and and maybe Ryan who's lurking in the background can can post the the link to our case study video but we we did a case study video with one of your students Lizzie um, mm. who makes use Lizzie. of um, of iPad it's a fantastic story um, but I think it's also really important to see the benefits there that you can have and that the new abnormal might um, be where the technology can add additional value to special educational needs students as well or harder to reach students. Absolutely and I think that's where we have really seen the, the value of that live video in reaching out to them in supporting them so they've had their own separate video support from our inclusive learning team and separate classes that they're also getting additional resources in um yeah and that you know i guess that fits with cpd as well so we've provided our um learning inclusivity team with additional cpd and training on using those accessibility tools so they can then work with students but you know often they say people like lizzie pretty much figure out how it's going to work for her and then feed that back to them um so a lot of them you know very quickly pick up things from students how they've customized the device to you know best support their own learning and fed that mm -hmm. back and then we you know, we spread that to everyone else. Yeah. Um, thanks, Ryan. I know I see that you've um, you've put that in the um, in the chat. I'd ask you not to go and look at the video just yet because we're still talking and that'd be really <laughs> good. Um, but absolutely take time to read that. And, and we've also got another case study on the Ferris as a, as, a, as a school, as an academy as well, which is hugely powerful. And the story even from two or three years ago is, is still important now. Um, so one of the things that I often get is uh, asked, well, how do we measure the success of, of, of iPads? And, and I think we've kind of bullet pointed four areas here and there's lots of conversation around it. But student outcome is important. You know, financial impact and longevity is absolutely key. You know, looking at the technologies is, is future proofing. And then kind of also what are the next steps look like? Because you and I have often had the conversation is once you've reached that 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 success you don't just stop you have to carry on as you rightly mentioned um in terms of student outcomes over the the the, the kind of the eight years of the one-to-one -one route what have you seen as a, as, as a real positive 
Um, so I think, I mean, several, and I'll go through them. But I, yeah. I, I think we it just probably needs a health warning that, you know, I think we, we do see people think it's a magic bullet. Here's technology. Therefore, you know, everything goes up. Um, and we've always likened it to behind me, out of shot, is uh, our exercise bike. I've never used it. Am I any fitter? No, it just sits there. My daughter uses it. I don't. Uh, um, so it's like that. So I think used well, you know, we see it as, as a catalyst to improve teaching and learning, to enhance what people do. Um, and we've definitely seen that. So our early adopters that probably had the, the most confidence and embedded it the most, math, science, PE, you know, still perform very strong. And they've had some amazing results, really pulled themselves up. Um, and, it, you know, it's played very big roles there. It's, it's not a magic bullet, like I say. Um, I could look at faculties that were quite slow, um, that didn't get as involved, you know, particularly early on and didn't really see much improvement. So there are nice correlations, you know, that you can't definitively say X equals Y. Um, we definitely saw increases in top grades where it was well embedded with some of those tools. Um, we found that some of the pupil premium students, because they all, you know, they've all got them, they're a hundred percent inclusive. Yeah. Um, the quality of their work massively improved and that led to, you know, improved exam performance and, and uh, much better controlled assessment. Uh, Cause that allowed them to organize things better to present work in, you know, in DT and subjects like that way, way beyond what they would normally do. And a lot of individual success stories, like you said, with Lizzie, Lizzie's applying to the sixth form. Um, so I think that there's a whole load of, you know, outcomes that go from the individual to to groups. Um, it's quite crude, I think, just to say you've got them, therefore your headline results will all go up. It's it's not going to do that. Um, but I, I think, you know, where it's well thought and it's embedded into faculty plans and they're making it do stuff they need to do that they weren't doing well before, you know, it, it will improve them. But every school has its own set of metrics, whether that's improved engagement, behavior, reading, you know, I think... You mentioned the Apple Distinguished Schools, Tom, and if you look at the the books, if you go in the Apple Bookstore yeah. and browse Apple Distinguished Schools, every one talks about their outcomes. They're all different, and you know yeah. I love that because it yeah. it shows every leadership team can look at what's their their big drivers for their development plan and their strategy going forward. You know, and there's probably a school that's had that and tried to deliver that through their their one to one yeah. program. And you and, and you talk, you talk about that, Greg. And obviously, the, the leadership workshops that that I run, um, one of the things that we absolutely talk about is, um, you know, what does that, what do those measurements of success look like? And you know, for some for some schools, it may be around, um, you know, financing or improved financing. For others, it is around literacy. Some others, numeracy. Um, you know, behavior is an interesting one because often people think, oh, if they're going to have a device in their hands, they're going to get distracted. They're not going to behave as well. But actually, we see an uplift. In behavior more often than not and i know that you haven't mentioned it directly but we, you and i have spoken about it um but you didn't see any downturn in behavior um you know no i mean we we've had what eight nine years you know we 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 have i think there's a fallacy sometimes that schools just took them out let kids do what they want you yeah know, so we don't um you know if kids aren't supposed to have them out they'll be told to leave them shut in the bag just like you would with anything um so, you know, we manage what students could do on them. We control that with the MDM and with managed Apple IDs so they can't just download any apps and hotspot or do VPNs. Um, we have clear class rules on what we do and don't expect. We can reward students that are really well behaved, give them access to extra apps and things like that. And we can, you know, penalize those that don't. Students mess around with the camera, you know, two seconds, you can turn that camera off. So for us, it's about working with the students to manage very effective approaches to digital safety and, and um, online safety um, and just, you know, develop those responsible behaviours. Um, yeah. And you know, we, we've had very few big incidents, really, you know, and, and even those, you know, often there's a dual side to, to some good comes out of it. Um, so, I, yeah, I think it's been very positive. Um, but a lot of that, it's clear communication with all stakeholders, like you said, with the parents, with the teachers, with the students, you know, what you can and can't do. Um, all our students and parents sign an acceptable use policy. Um, so parents, you know, parents it, sign it as well, it's do they? It's not. They, the parents sign it, and then when we hand it out to students, they sign it as well, so we can remind them of it, and if necessary, you know, hold it up. Um, <laughs> and that, you know, it, we've seen ones from America that run to seventy pages with subclause fifty eight point two. Ours is just you know half a side of obvious stuff that we would expect yeah. them to do and not do. Yeah um and i most students are very good about that i think yeah. they, they respect it and yeah. you know see it as fair 
Um, so yeah, and I think, you know, we're so big, we have to get this sort of stuff right. Yeah. The behavior just fits in really with the normal behavior policy we do anyway. It's not a different policy for that. Um, you know, part of the, the sanctions and things just fit in with what we would do for, for other things, you know, not doing homework or being late or, yeah. so, you know, getting your iPad and misuse is just another of, of part of it. And, the dog ate you know, my iPad. Really well for us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's got equipment. It's got to be there like a pen or stuff. So, so. so just just on that, Greg. Just in, I know you kind of t t touched on you know all the, the, those outcomes, the, the positives in that, and, and I guess um, the financial one is the impact of that and mm. the longevity. And um, I'm looking at the notes that we've got from here, but you know these better than others. But actually, um, what is great that I can highlight is you have seen some sort of reduction in ICT costs, which has allowed you to use those budgets for other things. But what's the real wins for you in terms of the financial impact and longevity for you? Um, so, I mean, I mentioned, you know, scrapping stuff. So we've got rid of seven computer suites. I mean, we've got to put another one in this summer in our, our new campus, but that's a different reason. Yeah. Um, 12 sets of laptops, probably about 50, 60 printers. And we're, we're still trying to get that down. And the learning platforms we stopped buying interactive whiteboards and um, you know all of that saves quite a lot of money because you're not spending on those annually like you always were you're not committing technician time um you know we did some sums and i think if you look at reductions in headline it budgets over several years and printing and vles you know we, we estimate we saved around about a million pounds that if we kept doing what we were doing would have needed to be spent to you know to, to achieve that Per uh, year, that's quite. We talked about this at Bet last year. It's, it's quite an impressive figure. Um, you know, unfortunately, it hasn't all come to me. But it's fine. Uh, it's my budget. Um, but you know, from a school point of view, that's excellent because it's allowed us to do other things. And you know, the IT has stayed at the forefront of what we do. It's worked really well. But we've been able to move that money elsewhere. So I, I think probably for me, that's that's the biggest thing. So Greg, sorry, just a million pounds overall, or a million pounds per year? Oh no, no, a million pounds a year. I wish, um, <laughs> you know, we, we over eight years, we, you know, we've certainly reduced by, you know, several hundred thousand what yeah. we've spent on traditional computer replacements, laptops, printers, all of that. Um, we've probably reduced annually, you know, spending on worksheets by, you know, 15, 20, 30,000 pounds even. Yeah. Um, we probably reduced by about 50. 15,000 pound a year, what we would have spent on online tools, VLEs, learning platforms, yeah. you know, gaming systems online. We, we just use all free stuff apart from Shobi, um, almost everything else. You know, we, we find free tools that do it. Yeah. And I think just, just going back, just going back to that point, and I, I, and I was kind of playing with the million pound, but um, actually what, what, what often gets asked is where, you know, if I, if I go down the route of, for example, iPad, you know, and we say, well, you can, you can save money and you can, you can look at repurposing that. People don't, I think it all adds up and it's about those little wins that you can have and repurpose where you need to. And as you've rightly pointed out, over that long period of time, which is, you know, eight years, it's a lot of money. Yeah, it is. And some of it, you know, it's not always by choice. Some of it, you just, you know, this is what you've got uh, make do with yeah. it. But I think, you know, because the students have a device, you can find free tools that do, okay, maybe what you used to have to pay for. Um, you know, you, you can find ways to try and get more online reporting and self-help out there so you don't need as much technician time to deal with it. So I, I think sometimes, you know, like they say with, with um, necessity being the mother of invention, some of it comes from that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still an impressive amount. And I think other schools, you know, would say similar. You, you can conversely bring it in and just keep chucking your money at the same old, same old. And it, you know, it, it won't achieve a lot financially. So it's about how you do that. Um, so, you know, we've made it part of, of what we do. We, you know, the, the, the parents pay a contribution to it. We use pupil premium, um, to, to pay some of that, not, you know, just to, to give the kids an iPad, but we, we use it annually. Um, and you know, that works really well. It's quite effective. It still saves most of the pupil premium for staffing costs and extra, you know, literacy and numeracy support. Yeah. Um, it's just working with what you've got and finding the best route that fits you, the best financial model. Um, you know, I think one thing that was happening probably about eight, nine years ago was visualizers coming in. But if you've got an iPad, you can just hold it up, achieve the same thing, don't need them. So, you know, we, we stopped that dead and we never invested in them really after mm. that. And so that, and that goes back, that, that, that next bit, the technology bit, is about what that classroom environment looks like. And I think, you know, you, you mentioned, without me prompting, 
about not having to use interactive whiteboards. And I think, you know, my, my personal view is on, you know, interactive whiteboards are great if they're being used well, but if they're not being used well, they're, they're a huge amount of financial resource. Um, and so how do we do things differently? And the classroom um, can look differently now. We, you know, we do live in that world of Victorian age where the, the teacher traditionally stands at the front and, you know, is mm. kind of tied to the, to the front board. The ability of having a device that allows you to be much more versatile and, and walk around the room, you know, where you do have a behavioural issue, you know, I always remember this in my own schooling is somebody being shouted at was very obvious and, and apparent and could actually make a situation worse. Just having a teacher be able to go and stand next to a pupil without having to tell them off can have a, a real positive impact as well. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, when we talk about financial or operational efficiencies, we talk absolutely about planning what the classroom of the future might look like. So when you're going to do a refresh, mm. do you need to do it in the same way that you've historically done it? The answer is probably no. What, what we need to make sure is that you have the decision or, or the information to make those informed decisions so that when you put that, your plan together as, a, as, a, as an institution, and this is obviously not aimed at you, but as a customer, then when you plan and that point that you made at the very beginning, that strategic planning is so important that you can then start building that program that will allow you to get to where you want to be with the technology. Yeah, definitely. And I'm thinking like two years ago, we inherited um, uh, a UTC that was built in Burton, but yeah. never opened. So that eventually became our sixth form campus. It's really Great nice building. new building. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it had no technology in it. Apart from the wire and infrastructure, you know, we had to fix stuff. Um, but we just put flat screens in. We got a load of them in bulk, you know, good price, able to fit them really quickly. Um, with Apple TVs and, and the advantage is if something breaks, you know, in a few minutes, someone can swap the TV, swap the Apple TV, yeah. you're back in use again. It's, it's so much easier. Um, we've also got them in breakout spaces, which means, you know, small groups can be taken out to one of those spaces. You know, you can do mentoring, you can put the work up on the screen again. Uh, it, it's just so much easier. And I think you mentioned, Tom, about, um, you know, facing the class and, you know, obviously got my iPad here with me. Um, but, you know, one of my absolutely favorite tools, there is a, an app called EduCreations. It's free, if you can see that. Yeah. And it just turns my iPad into a very simple, like a smart board. If I can use Apple TV, or if I don't have it, something like Reflector or Air Server, which is a couple of pounds, sits on a laptop. Yeah. It allows me to wirelessly send that, you know, to any project or any screen. But I can write while I face the class. And that's quite a game changer. What's that called, Greg? That one? Even with an interactive whiteboard, you often turn around, you back to the students. Yeah. It's called EduCreations. EduCreations. There you are, Paul. I knew. We use, um, yeah. we use the free version. I knew Paul was going to ask that. I mean, it's, it's an explain everything. Um, um, it's an explain everything kind of esque kind of thing, right? Is that whiteboard? As long as you can stream your iPad. It's, it's yeah. Um, it's the budget supermarket version of, of um, Explain Everything, I imagine. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we put the free version on and our students use as a, a, a slate. So we've been looking at what happens when they come back in September, you know, and you want them to be able to write and hold it up to the teacher. Well, A, if you use something like Nearpod, you can see all their screens on your laptop or iPad, so it's not a problem. B, you know, they can just write on something like that, hold it up. You've got no, you know, no hygiene problems cleaning because it's their own device. Um, so things like that, you know, they, they work really well. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, like you say, that, you know, the outcomes for students being able to see the teacher and have a better dialogue or being able to go to a class and put your device in front of them and say, write on it or airplay your work. Yeah, that's a real change. It's a simple thing, but it changes the whole dynamic. Yeah. So and actually, what, what I would argue, actually, um, from my perspective and my, my own experience is when you start talking about that bigger, um, wider approach around not just the device and the management, but actually the teaching me mechanism and, and the classroom, it sometimes alleviates a lot of the other barriers that are, are earlier on in the conversation and, the, and actually goes back to what I like talking about, which is the why or the just cause of the whole program and people can see that bigger approach and it's really important um I, i'm conscious of time greg um and i could talk to you f for ages but in terms of next steps um is there anything and what i mean by next steps is you know what are your thoughts on maybe keyboard cases or you know what do you think um, about the new stuff that's coming yeah i mean there's there's lots of nice stuff we're always led a little bit by you know we never have as much money as i'd like so um you know, we, we so we do things, you know, cheaper, especially because of our numbers. Yeah, difficult. I'd love to get more principal. 
2,000 students are stepping in. Um, so yeah, we, we buy them cheap styluses from, from Taiwan um, in, in bulk, you know, with that number. Um, but certainly key things for us, you know, we, we want to look at um, better provision for our younger students on seven and eight. Um, we're already looking at apps like Pages now that you can publish really good books. There's been some great Apple Distinguished Educator seminars and workshops this week we've been looking at in how to do more with Pages to get more student content out yeah. there. So we'll definitely be looking at that. Um, we've been revamping our CPD offer. Um, and I think I tweeted it. If you follow me on Twitter, you, you, you'll see it. Um, but we've been looking at, you know, the levels of competence, what skills we expect for staff as beginner, intermediate, you know, advanced type of thing. Um, and we've had a rethink on what apps we wanted to focus on, what skills, what Google tools. So it's all part of a consistent um, approach, you know, that we can then target our training at those groups as well. Yeah. So we can achieve these baseline levels that staff are good at. I think sometimes we've, we've been conscious of building up some staff as iPad champions, but... I think probably what you need is a higher overall level of everyone's confidence rather than a few people who are better, really. Because yeah. um, often they, they get quite busy and they're not able to do it. So we're really trying to focus on the mass um, of many people as possible to build up their, their confidence. And, and I guess on that, you know, we talk about the Apple Distinguished School Program, but Apple Teacher is a, is another great free resource from Apple. Um, Apple Teacher dot, uh, is it appleteacher.apple.com? Um, uh, yep. Uh, or, but, but again, uh, you know, free resource which allows that a kind of a minimum level for some teachers, and they can they can get a, a certification at the end of that. Um, but I think you're right. Is is we talk about SAMI model um, and aiming at students, but actually there's a SAMI model kind of vertical for for teachers, and one one teacher's redefinition is another teacher's um, substitution, and we need to be really mindful of that. Um, I know there's not. Uh, there's not any questions at the moment um but if there are any questions whilst we're just talking feel free to leave them in the chat because uh, after this um the next slide is pretty much a, a thank you um so i don't know greg just for a couple of minutes anything else that you feel that you would like to to, to showcase or highlight that we haven't discussed or are you are you kind of uh, <laughs> i think um so you know the one of the biggest things we've i think we've always focused on really well was assessment for learning um, and we've done quite a lot of work on how we build that into our learning cycles. So, you know, rather than just an optional do a little bit with the iPads if you want, you know, we've really integrated it into, um, you know, what we call the do now phase, like the entrance phase where it's an entrance ticket. So we can diagnostically check, do they recall what they did last lesson? You know, are there any misconceptions we need to clear up now before we add new learning? Um, we've always used iPads a lot in the demonstrate phase to get kids to create new work. Um, you know, even things like making a movie is really powerful. We, we've we've had a lot of success where we make movies and then you look at the way the students explain things in the movie and it's a really good window into how well they understand a topic diagnostically. Have they got the key understanding right? Are they using the language right? Um, so I, I think a lot of our work over eight years has looked at that. Last couple of years, we've been looking at some of those tools for assessment and how we then give really good whole class feedback so that we can save staff time and they've appreciated that. So you mentioned things like explain everything, Tom. So, you know, how do we look at um, maybe using a quiz app, see what kids know or don't know, what they get right or wrong. How do we then create a simple movie of the member staff to, you know, go through some of that and then yeah. throw that out through Shobi or Google Classroom or other tools so that, you know, in, in 10, 20 minutes, we can give all of them really valuable feedback on their next steps um, and still have time then to go personal and give individual students feedback yeah. where they need it within the same parameters of time and so on that we would have done normally. And, and I think that's important to remember as well is, you know, we the biggest, another big question is, oh, what apps do I need for, for maths, English, science? And I think actually what, what um, Paul Hutton talks about is that core and more set or course, core apps, more apps. And, you know, that core set is, 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 um, uh, subjects non, you know, subject not specific, and it's about um, about the content that goes in there. I talked about explain everything because it's been around a long time. But you're right; it's maybe I should have said something that allows me to use my device as a whiteboard that fits what we're trying to do, or um, mm. an app that allows us to give the feedback to to, to 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 students and so on. And I think it's always about looking at, at what apps are going to work because there's, there's hundreds and thousands aimed at education. But what is really going to work mm. for us as an institution? Um, and one of the things um, that I remember working with the trust on is that as as they deployed their apps and went finally one to one um, on a on a on a program, is that the apps that the students had through every year group was the same, mm. bar the, the the very specific ones. 
And actually, it was really about the content that was in those apps or being put in those apps by the students rather than I need to go into year seven and learn another app that I haven't known before. Yeah. Uh, and I think what, what always interested me is we put, you know, we had our key group of apps and you'll, you know, if you look on our website, defos.com slash iPad or, or Twitter, um, you know, you'll see that stuff. But it, it's interesting. We put others out for things. So like when they do physics, there's a really good wind tunnel app and it, you know, it models a 3000 pound wind tunnel. It's, it's a genius app. Mm. But you know, what amazed me, I had a, a low ability degree of 10. They'd already been playing with it and drawing with it and looking at shapes and, they came with some really good questions and a good level of understanding already. And that's the beauty of them having that device. You know, they play with this stuff in a way they never would have before a science lesson for me. Mm. Um, so I think, yeah, giving them those tools and access to them through like self-service app stores, um, same with the books is really powerful because they can continue to widen their, their knowledge and understanding on yeah. their own without, yeah. you know, you being in front of them. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's no, you know, it's, it's usually free. There's, there's no cost to that sort of stuff. Yeah. Greg, listen, um, I, th there's been no other questions, either that we've done a great job talking about what we've been talking about and, and, and we've done that already <laughs> or, or people are a little bit shy. But what I would say is um, we're, we're always available to have that conversation. Um, a huge thank you um, to you again for, for, for taking the time out to, to come and speak with us. Um, you're, you are oh. always a, a very esteemed and welcome guest. Um, thank you to all of our uh, panel Sorry, all of our um, attendees today, we, we hope that it's been of value to you. And obviously, we, we, we'll support any questions that you have thereafter. Um, we, we've put the case study for um, for, for the Lizzie uh, Ball story. Please, please do take time to, to view that. I think it's, it's hugely powerful and really drives home a very important message. Um, uh, thank you, Louise, for, for joining us. Um, and, um, and yeah, uh, I guess at this point, I will um, ask us to turn off the cameras. Um, Greg, thank you again. Thank you, Ryan. My pleasure. And I will um, play the music. We'll stay on for a couple more minutes in the background and have a great rest of day. <laughs>